So um, thanks so much for Dr. Patrick McCabe's for coming here. Dr. McCabe's was born and raised in the Bay Area. Um, for his education training work, he's been uh, a little bit all over the place. He's lived in Indiana, Alabama, and Nevada. Uh, he completed his gastroenterology fellowship at California Pacific Medical Center, and he's currently working on a locums basis um, for the Alameda Health System. In his spare time, he likes to exercise, watch sports and film, and try out new restaurants and read. So thank you so much for uh, presenting, and we look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. High. Um, yeah, so my talk will focus on private practice um, setting for contract negotiations, and mainly cover the what you can negotiate. Um, the how uh, can be um, very, very hyper-specific depending on who you're talking to. Um, and this is also just kind of a collection of uh, observations and interpretations um, I've had during, I've probably done 25 interviews um, overall. Um, so at one, I think, principle for private practice, um, I haven't read this book, I've read summaries, but the uh, concept, it's uh, skin in the game. Uh, the doctors, um, depending on the size of the group, it will influence how much input you will have, but the doctors will have input and also bear the consequences um, of decisions they make about the practice. Uh, another principle is custom. Um, I think in college, um, one of my classes basically said John Stuart Mill summarized custom at what he called it the oppression of custom. It's not a law, it's not a rule, but it's so ingrained and habitual that um, they function as rules. And usually a practice you'll talk to will use them as points of reference. Um, and you will have to basically build your um, stated desires from those points of reference. And in exchange, usually uh, the, the doctors you negotiate with will probably ask for um, a, a concession on certain fronts if you ask for a change. Um, so um, we'll talk about common categories and, and then timing within uh, private practice negotiation influence those categories. So before you negotiate, when you are interested in the practice, you'll want to identify how big is the practice and what's the structure. Um, so I, I think based on my prior experience, the classic one is there is a practice partnership. Um, so usually you have a, a run-in period where you're an associate, but you don't have um, access to ancillary revenue. You may not have a vote uh, during group decisions. And then when you reach partnership, you will have those privileges and then be able to buy into these external revenue streams. Um, other spins on this, some places you're sharing overhead, sharing an office, but you there's no partnership. You're, maybe you're your own limited liability company. And then you, the group customarily has bought into a surgery center uh, that's external to, to the group. Uh, so it's not quite related to your um, private practice structure or the practice structure itself. And this is all separate from the character of the group and the personalities involved, which you will also want to know. Those are important factors in compatibility about you know, whether you see yourself at a place long term. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about you know, other influencing factors about how has buy-in worked into these surgery centers in the past, because at some point in time, these partners were associates like you at one point. Um, and that influences why they make certain choices that they have. Uh, I'll say that during a lot of the interviews, um, it's sometimes hard to draw out the financial information from um, the partners. I, I think on their end, they're trying to identify whether you know, you're a good doctor, can they get along with you? Um, will, are you a good clinician? Um, although on the other hand, from your perspective, you're gonna be an associate for only a, a finite period of time. And you wanna know if the group is financially healthy enough and offer you the financial security and work-life balance that justifies staying with the group and going through the associate period. And my impression is usually the details about, you know, what's it like to buy in? Um, what are the duties of being a partner? How to become a partner? Um, that gets discussed very close to when a contract is issued. And after when that happens, the, 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 uh, implicitly the group seems to, the group to lean towards um, expecting a yes, no answer, um, or arguably I didn't push the envelope enough in negotiating with them. Uh, one resource suggested that 10% um, of groups issue a letter of intent. I, I've seen this once or twice. I found it kind of confusing. It's not a legally binding document. 
Um, for my understanding, um, it's one of the lawyers I used to do my contract. He wrote an article online about it. Um, it. It's more of a form of etiquette. It's most it's meant to set the framework for negotiation, meaning you have a verbal agreement that your associate salary is going to be three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. It's in the letter of intent. If you change your mind, it's considered a faux pas. Now, is it a deal breaker? Maybe not, but um, some suspicion may be cast upon you for, you know, suddenly changing your mind after a written document, albeit it's not legally binding. So, associate salaries I've seen a range from anywhere from one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in the first year to above five hundred thousand dollars. Classically, less money up front may mean a faster partnership track. So where I was in Reno, which I think is pretty standard for where I was, you need to earn back your salary plus the overhead incurred to be, meet one criterion for eligibility to become a partner. I've seen some exceptions. One group offered just a set salary. It didn't matter um, if you earned that back or not. Um, the second part, uh, we'll talk about a separate slide is how long the associate period is. The minimum I've seen is about one year uh, of time served. Um, I've not seen a scenario where you earn back your salary at month nine. You know, could, could you approach the group and say, I'm ready to buy in now? Um, and then some other, um, I think, less standard ones are um, usually money earned is collections, which is a percentage of, of what you bill. And where I was in Reno, the average is about, you collected about 33 to 37% of what you bill. Uh, I have spoken to some other physicians where um, they didn't explain further, but um, maybe they, they would, uh, you'd be assessed for the, the value you earned that first year based on what you billed. I, I would say that's very rare. And then some groups do RVUs, um, which may come up in uh, other talks, but that's meant to even out um, discrepancies in insurance reimbursement per physician, meaning if you happen to see 10 Medicaid patients in one day and your partner saw 10 Blue Cross patients, you know, that can cause some tension. You might say, well, why did that happen? Um, I'm getting paid less for the same type of work. Um, and RVUs are meant to um, equalize that. Um, also, before a partnership, you can negotiate bonuses, sign on and relocation. Um, I had a lawyer kind of help specify those, those sums. Um, and then you try to balance that out with, with other goals that you have. You can negotiate the overall raw amounts of this. And then usually there's a vesting period, meaning you stick with the group for six months, but then you leave. The group will often want you to pay some of that back um, over a specific time frame. Um, you could also negotiate to uh, break up that payment over years um, rather than doing one payment. Uh, I had one or two groups offer a fellowship stipend, meaning you know, you got, it's December, you're in graduate in June, and you decide to sign on now. Uh, the one group offered a no strings attached fellowship stipend, um, just I think as a gesture of goodwill that you're no longer on the market. Um, but again, not common. So partnership tracks, so going back to an earlier discussion, making private practice a little different, because again, there's that associate period and partnership period. So in some ways, the, the the, the payment you get, the schedule you have will maybe change versus other jobs where what you get uh, year one is very similar to what you get year two and year five and year 10. So I think one question is, do you negotiate now and or later? And, and again, I think from a private practice partner perspective, they're trying to figure out if you're a good doctor and they're focused on the associate period. Um, and if they, they, and they won't know until you're doing your associate period. So in some ways, they're not that, I think, interested in negotiating, you know, the terms of partnership. And on the other hand, if you wait, you know, you do your associate period and you have worries already about certain aspects of becoming a partner, you've already committed that time. Um, but I, I have seen, heard about changes being done at that point. Um, and again, this will come down to how comfortable you feel talking with uh, the group. Some, some groups are more open than others uh, when you speak with them. So when you become partner, so what separates um, private practice from uh, academics and foundation employed is you get to participate in the ancillary revenue streams. Um, some groups have a lot, uh, some groups have only a few. Um, I guess before we get to that, some groups will ask um, for payment for um, goodwill or a patient pool, meaning let's say there's a retiring partner, you're coming in, it's a competitive uh, market, 
but that retiring partner has a pool of patients, you're going to get that pool of patients. Um, sometimes there'll be a money value attached to that rather than you having to recruit or find patients on your own and build those referral lines with PCPs. Uh, I'd say this is the minority of um, groups that I've spoken to um, do this. A few groups also do a hard assets buy-in, meaning you know, they may own the endo center, the furniture and the scopes, and you'll pay um, a, a share of that, usually divided equally amongst the partners. Okay, um, so the ancillary revenue buy-ins, um, again, often associated with becoming partner. So the bedrock is a surgery center. I've seen values uh, for revenue per year ranging from $75,000 to $300,000. Um, I was coached in fellowship if that you, you don't have access to this in private practice, it, you, it's not a truly a viable model. Again, my associate uh, year salary was $320,000. I think on professional fees and call stipends, I made $380,000, so not much more than a hospitalist. So um, what is a surgery center buy-in? So when you do a colonoscopy at an outpatient facility, there's a facility fee that's generated, and I have interpreted it as um, a usage fee instead of doing it in the hospital. And usually it's, it's still cheaper than um, doing all those procedures in the hospital. So what are the types of buy-ins for this? So some practices have a fixed value buy-in. One group had zero buy-in. You are an associate for a year, they like you. You can become a partner in, uh, um, in the surgery center for zero dollars. Uh, there's a book value buy-in. Um, I guess kind of akin to the Kelly Blue Book for cars, although no one's ever pointed me to a manual. Um, but theoretically, there is um, a, a value assigned to it with depreciation. My Reno group used the book value. Uh, there's a fair market value, which is kind of a comparison, I think, amongst the region, but can be highly arbitrary. And then locally, um, I saw it a lot in San Francisco, is there's the EBITDA buy-in, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. And it's often a multiple of the revenue you would generate in a year. It's usually a three or four X multiplier. Um, the buy-in could be all at once, uh, depending on the sum, meaning you just pay up front. More common is you pay it over years. Um, so where I was in Reno, um, year one, you pay for a half share over that first 12 months. Year two, you pay for the next half share over 12 months. Next is pathology. So you can, um, so some groups will prepare their own slides and they can bill for that. Other groups will have that plus a pathologist reading the slides in house. And I've seen each doctor make anywhere from $40,000 to $66,000 a year. Um, some groups, this will depend on state law to a degree, uh, is anesthesia. So Oregon and Idaho, GI physicians can administer their own propofol if they do extra training and they typically don't bill extra for anesthesia. For us in Reno, we had CRNAs deliver propofol, and I think our group made about $800 a day if we keep the CRNAs, so it was a very competitive environment, uh, and then you divide that amongst um, the group. Um, some groups do fold in the anesthesia revenue into the surgery center revenue because sometimes they have an external third party help manage um, the, the surgery center. Um, we partly did this in Reno. It got shuttered after the private equity platform we spoke to um, suggested we either fund it on our own or shutter it. Um, but the way this works is a third party would link you to companies that are conducting research. So we did a colon cancer one, for example. Um, and then you link them with a research coordinator. And then the, the research company, I think, pays you for helping recruit patients, basically, what it comes down to. Um, and it seems that... It's a lot of research projects for IBD. So if you have an infusion center, um, that may be more fruitful. Uh, infusion, um, this is, I'd say, less than half of the groups I've spoken to have this. It's complex. Um, actually, one article I read suggested no one really knows how you bill for it. It just said there's something for medication itself in the service. Um, there's a lot of state regulation. Um, it can be expensive. You have to figure out what happens if you bought the drug and let's say you have patients not show up, you're on the hook for that cost. Um, one group I spoke to has a third party help manage that for multiple groups. So they kind of shuttle the medica unused medications to these other places. 
Um, another one is uh, real estate. So in Reno, that was, I think, a, a barrier. So we did not own our own building. So we're paying a lease. We had to ask for permission to make any renovations that were needed. Other groups own their land and own their building, and they can lease it to themselves. And you can participate in that. And um, I don't know how it works. I'm not a tax expert, but I was told that it can function as tax write-offs. Uh, some groups, I think, have their own pharmacies. Uh, you can dispense bowel prep for your practice. Uh, and maybe other medications too, like PPIs. Uh, I don't know how complex this gets. And then lastly, there's some ca cash pay services you could provide, um, whether it's gastric balloons, nutrition supplements. I think one group was thinking about infrared uh, weight loss um, services as well. Um, another layer that I'll just touch on, some groups are multi-specialty. There was one in Southern California. You can participate in buying shares in the lab centers they have, an imaging center they have, and even a gym. Um, that gets more complex because other ENT physicians, PCPs are, are buying into that as well. So apart from um, these revenue streams, what can you negotiate for, um, I guess, in relation to work? One is, um, Scoping, um, you wanna know, is it equal amongst the partners? How does it change? Um, I'd say a 60% scope to 40% clinic ratio seems to be common. Sometimes we'll see 50-50. Uh, where I was in Reno, it was 40-60 the other way, which um, became an issue later on. Another is um, negotiating how long do you have for each procedure block, which will affect your productivity. Is it a 45 minute double, 30 minutes? Uh, one group I met did 20 minute polos. Um, same thing with clinic. Um, do you get 40 minutes to 45 minutes for new patients, 15 minutes for follow-ups? Some groups do 30 minutes for uh, any patient, maybe for ease of scheduling. Um, others can kind of play catch up with meaning you have a complex 30 minute patient, but an easy follow-up and it evens out throughout the day. Um, next is the non-compete. Um, factors here are radius, duration, and circumstances of termination. Um, Back. Um, in California, this is hard to enforce. Um, a private equity group that, from Georgia that approached us in Reno said they've won about 50% of their cases outside of California. Um, so, and you wanted to find what counts as working within it. So, meaning if you left a practice but uh, ended up at a surgery center within the radius, that might count as violating the non compete. I think um, ours was 25 miles from all practice sites, and we had about three practice sites. Um, the non-compete should not apply if you're fired without cause. Um, things you could negotiate are buying out the non-compete, um, and even buying it out in an amortized fashion over time. You can also negotiate the work week length. Um, some patterns, I've seen a lot of four-day work weeks in private practice uh, counted as full-time. Um, so, which begs the question, what counts as part-time and will they want you to do part-time in that case, if it's less than four? Um, and sometimes the amount of staffing you have will govern. So I offered to do 15 minute clinic visits at one point. Um, we didn't have the staff to room the patients that quickly. Locations, uh, you wanna make sure this is equitable amongst two partners. So when I joined my group, we're initially gonna cover three hospitals. And then about a month before I joined, they were gonna cover a fourth. To, try to crowd out any foundation employee GI. Um, our contracts were not changed. All the partners covered it um, on the private practice partner end. They probably don't want to revise 12 contracts. There are about 12 to 15 positions in my group. Um, so you probably would want to work with a lawyer to find the right amount of flexible language to protect you, um, to keep you uh, measured with um, the rest of the partners. You can negotiate vacation and private practice. The more you work, the more you make. Um, so my reading group had the spectrum. One guy took maybe one or two weeks. Another took 12 weeks, would go fishing in Mongolia and the Amazon. Um, you want to negotiate day and night call. This goes back to practice structure. So where I was in Reno, we would devote a full week in the hospital. We're not seeing patients for the most part outpatient, which is good on one hand, you're can focus on inpatient. On the other hand, that's unused space that you're paying overhead for. Other practices, if you're not covering a busy hospital, for example, multiple practices are covering one hospital, you may only have one or two call days a week and maybe only one or two consults a day. And you'll see those consults either at lunch or maybe you try to end your workday early. 
um, to do that. So you want to clarify that with your group. Um, then overhead, you, I guess you could negotiate overhead itself. For example, we have three ERCP doctors in Reno. One would not go to Carson City to do ERCPs. So presumably, he was not billed for hospital privileging there. Um, but those are pretty minor details. Um, CME, you could also negotiate and maybe ask to be uh, have that uh, not counted against your productivity in some way. Uh, retirement planning. So where I was, you had to work at least six months. And that six months had to match up with um, either J January 1st or July 1st to start um, um, paying into your 401k. And I suppose you can negotiate to make that quicker. I'll run through this because um, there'll be in the other talks about types of insurance. Um, so let's say you join a private practice that already has done a private equity deal or it will go through one. Um, so your, your buy-in at that point will be a little different. So uh, the private equity platform will likely offer stock in the platform itself. And it's usually about maybe 25% of whatever payout you'll have. You, they don't want you leaving like a week later with the shares. So you'll have to ask what the vesting period is. Other things to ask are you'll want to know, you may hear the term bites of the apple. How many times has the platform been transacted? Meaning, so you have shares of the first time through, they rise in value and they get bought out the second time. And if you join in after that first bite, you know, stocks don't go up forever. Um, so you, you may want to ask, you know, what do they project, I guess, that stock value would be and whether they have access to that. And then some private equity companies actually will take more majority control of, of a practice. So you become an employee. Um, so that'd be another factor to ask about. Um, another one is intellectual property. So who owns it if you develop it? So I think some of the hospital employee contracts I saw, which was different than my private practice contract, is if you, so in Reno, if you develop, let's say an invention, that's yours, it's not the groups. Other groups may say, well, whose time are you doing that on? Whose resources are you using? And they may say, that's, that's our resource. And therefore what you've invented is ours. Um, so if you are on the creative side, I'm not, um, you probably will want language um, supporting that. Pre-private equity, I, I didn't do this, but you could theoretically ask how to be incorporated into a deal. Um, there'll be political tensions with this, uh, meaning some of my big group, presumably I, the 11 other doctors would probably want similar clauses for that. Now, I, I, I suppose you could keep it on the down low. Um, I'm not sure how successful that would be. Um, but that, that would be a question to ask during interviews to see how groups are viewing the landscape. Lastly, actually not, not quite. Um, so if you do ERCP, motility, or hepatology, your practice will be a little different than everyone else's. And you may, and if you don't do these things, you may be conceding something or you may ask for other things. So if you do EUS, ERCP, you may be a more backup call than your colleagues. So what do they, the ERCP doctors get in return? Is it less overall call? Um, our group, um, didn't do that, but we paid them actually a stipend if they did a case where they had to clear out their schedule and come to the hospital and do it for us. Um, and then motility and hepatology, very complex patients, second opinions, takes longer. Um, so you'll want to know, you know, are, are you going to be on a different metric system for productivity in that case? Uh, one thing I didn't come up um, is, is how is maternity and paternity leave um, factor into this. So if you're a woman and you want to have children, I imagine this will be important and you want to ask how that happens. I've met plenty of women who are in private practice, but I never thought to ask um, how they handled that. Um, and then exits, um, typically it's a 90 day mutual notice for associate and partner. Um, you be careful with the language. So our group had a 90 day notice, but if you left within a year, you have to pay an exit fee. Um, how are disputes settled? It's usually arbitration. If you go through arbitration, you should get the same state lawyer. The lawyer who reviewed my contract went through the White Coat Investor was based in Pennsylvania, and that's kind of what he advised um, during my exit. Um, for the contract itself, though, um, you can use an out-of-state lawyer. They may charge by time or a flat rate. A flat rate usually means per copy of the contract reviewed. So when I got my contract, I sent it to the lawyer. To, to keep things um, 
uh, harmonious with the group, I was instructed to play dumb. And I would just say, hey, my lawyer said I should get this. My lawyer said I should ask for that. The group sent back a draft. And that would be billed again. So at some point, it's on you to determine you know, how many drafts of a contract you want to go through. Um, and then lastly, things I didn't do, but I could have, I could have extended the negotiating process and pushed for concessions with, um, based on what I was hearing from other uh, practices and asked for other specific clauses like about private equity, um, I, I guess protection if you, if you wanted to. Um, I've heard one of my former classmates, she had a group wait three months. I, I, wait, I let some groups wait two or three weeks at most before making a decision. And then factors that you can't change are voting structure, management structure, whether your group has bylaws and how closely they're followed. So my group had partners and some of the partners are part of a board of directors because our group was so large and had three sites. Some groups don't have that. So, it's, so our group is a little more bureaucratic. We didn't have blinded voting and a simple majority. Um, other groups, it's unanimous um, uh, in, 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 in blinded votes, for example. Um, and they're not likely to change those things just because you're applying and want to join. And then lastly, I would ask yourself, does the group want to or not? Because you can always walk away, so you should identify what your constraints are. Do you have to be in a certain region? Does a loved one or significant other have constraints as well? Um, so, because there's some pressure with some of these discussions. Um, so, at the end of the day, you, you have a decent amount of leverage uh, to exercise. That's it. Thanks so much, Dr. McCabe. A lot of uh, interesting topics discussed there. And um, again, please feel free to um, direct any questions in the chat and we'll answer them at the very end. Um, so Dr. Park uh, will be next. Um, Dr. Park um, is joining us from Hawaii. So thank you so much. He, um, completed his medical school at the University of Hawaii. He went on to uh, CPMC for internal medicine residency and stayed there for gastroenterology fellowship as well. And he's currently practicing at the Queens Medical Center in Hawaii. Um, so go ahead, Dr. Park. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Hai. Uh, can you folks see it okay? Thumbs up, we're good. Okay, all right. So hospital employment, uh, decidedly less complex than the wild world of private practice. Uh, the common refrain I hear from people who are interested in this model is going back to the fact that you just want to practice medicine. And I suppose it is the simplest model uh, when we're comparing the three between private practice and even the academic world, which has its own nuances uh, that Dr. Huang will review. And so I'll give a brief overview. And uh, I, I definitely think the question and answer portion will be uh, really helpful for you folks. And so just kind of a rundown of the employed model in general. Um, some of the pros uh, that you folks have probably already gleaned is that the salary is predictable. And in fact, your ceiling is, uh, uh, while capped, uh, you pretty much start near or at your ceiling. Uh, depending on how the uh, company uh, negotiates your salary. Uh, the benefits uh, are nice and are uh, and will come baked in uh, with most of the contracts, things like company matching, uh, PTO, maternity, uh, even stipends for your medical licensing, which you folks know is not cheap, uh, as well as opportunity for CME, so an educational fund. Uh, all things that you can uh, take advantage of that um, uh, as Dr. McCabe was saying, comes out of your pocket uh, for private practice. And in fact, it hits double, right? Because you eat what you kill in private practice. And uh, if you're not working, you're not making money. Uh, mobility is one that I think is not as widely thought about in terms of the employed model. So uh, fortunately or unfortunately, you will be a cog in the wheel of the medical industrial complex. You, uh, as, as, as smart and intelligent and resourceful as you folks are, you are replaceable and uh, you can actually use that to your advantage. So if you are only envisioning being somewhere for a short amount of time, you can and uh, you can pick up and leave and you aren't as invested as you might be uh, if you were in the private practice world or trying to gain tenure um, in, a, in a large academic setting. 
uh, possible con might, uh, if, if you're very entrepreneurial minded, uh, but a pro in, in many people's minds is that you don't have to run a business and a lot of us are not MBA trained. Uh, and so uh, can uh, once again, just focus on practicing the medicine. Job security, maybe not necessarily a huge pro, but in, in general, they want you, they need you. And especially for, uh, we'll, we'll take my institution, for example, Queens Medical Center. Uh, we are a level one trauma center. And if you folks don't already know, uh, all level one trauma centers require a, a gastroenterologist on call at all times. Uh, and so you are valued and you're needed in that regard. And so you have some level of job security. Um, there are career mentorship opportunities more so I think in the academic uh, employed model rather than a more clinical one, but those opportunities do still abound mainly because you'll be, uh, well, I was thinking more along the lines of solo uh, private practitioner. I'm sure if you're in a small group with other um, private practice docs who are interested in mentoring you, that uh, opportunity is available. Uh, access to the legal team, as much as we don't like to think about it, it is a unfortunate reality of our occupation. And uh, uh, anecdotes from my institution uh, tell me that it was nice to have um, a large corporation's legal team at your uh, beck and call when you need it. Um, those expenses can really ramp up. Uh, cons, uh, I think the biggest one that everyone thinks about with the employed model is the lack of autonomy. <clears throat> that comes in very, uh, very different forms, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, things uh, such as your schedule, although I feel like at my institution in particular, I am given actually a fair amount of autonomy to dictate my own schedule. But things like, uh, like Dr. McKay was alluding to, like, how much time do you want to spend with your clinic patients? Um, are they going to be very productivity minded, keep you down to 10, 15 minutes for follow ups, or are they going to allow you to have a little bit more breathing room, like half an hour for some of the follow ups, for example. Uh, I, I spent some time in the liver center here, and as you folks know, those decompensated cirrhotics, it's kind of hard to manage them in 10 minutes. And so the institution allows me some flexibility to extend my visit times up to half an hour, uh, even for follow up visits knowing that they're taking a hit, but they understand that the service is necessary. Uh, compensation, uh, it's pretty baked in, hard to negotiate against a large corporation. And your staff, so um, I have the, um, the honor, somewhat dubious, uh, to be the medical director here at Queens, uh, the GI department. And uh, I actually have zero control over the hiring and firing of my support staff. So my schedulers, my MAs, um, the nurses who work with me, I have a say in their, in how well they, uh, how competent they are in their job, but am I able to directly fire them? No, um, because I'm not in charge of them. I'm in a separate dyad. I'm treated in the physician arm. I'm just another employee and we work in parallel in the clinic. Uh, rules and bureaucracy as I'm sort of alluding to. Uh, and there's many of them and they're all nuanced, just as all institutions are nuanced and it's always a headache. Uh, intellectual property restrictions, uh, Dr. McCabe has already alluded to that. Generally, if you're employed by institution and you, um, and you make the next uh, bowel prep uh, that, is, um, that doesn't require any pills or prep, uh, then you will be a billionaire, but a billionaire for the institution and you will reap none of those benefits. Um, Taxes, I kind of added in there late only because, uh, you know, we are going to be W-2'd as a uh, employed model and Hawaii has one of the highest state tax rates uh, for income. And so there are more creative ways to shelter yourself uh, from income tax if you're in private practice, uh, but we are wholly unable to as an employed physician. So something to think about um, uh, depending on if you're looking at different states in terms of what their income tax is like. Um, this is a pro and con and more just kind of depends on your overall philosophy of medicine, the patient panel. So the patient panel um, is one of the elephants in the room in terms of when we are talking about employed models versus um, private practice. Uh, as, as many of you folks know, because you work at academic, academic institutions, you are insurance blind for the most part. Um, and that 
is not necessarily true for private practice. In private practice, you can pick and choose uh, who you want to see, not only based on patient factors, but also on financial factors. So there are private practices who will not accept certain insurances, such as most Medicaid insurances. Why? Because they don't reimburse well. Um, or more insidiously, maybe sometimes those patients might be less reliable. And so you don't not want to necessarily take care of them because it's not as financially lucrative. And so it kind of just depends on what your thoughts are in regards to that uh, equity or lack thereof. And, you know, we can all be sort of um, magnanimous about it, but it, it's a reality uh, of, of the practice. Productivity incentives can either be viewed as a carrot or a stick, and it kind of just depends on if you're a glass half full or half empty kind of person. Um, What's negotiable, what isn't? Dr. McCabe has already spoken about most of these things. I think my, my main take home point for this is to advocate yourself, but obviously you have to advocate for yourself within reason. You can't necessarily expect to have it all, um, especially when you're a uh, fresh uh, trainee coming out. So here's the list. Uh, we can kind of talk about more of these things, but a lot of these things we've already sort of uh, briefly mentioned. Uh, I will focus your attention to the show me the money column. These are things that you absolutely should be thinking about. Those tend to be the lower hanging fruit in terms of things that you can negotiate with most contracts that are coming out or that will be offered to you. And really think about the call and how that's going to affect you because gastroenterology, uh, we are a call specialty. And so that's like very likely gonna be part and parcel with um, any contract that you sign. Specialized endoscopy equipment, um, similar to what Dr. McCabe alluded to, if you are offering higher value, such as advanced services, in orthomonometry, endoflip, any of that stuff, you can and should ask for it, but you should also make sure that you are given appropriate um, compensation in that regard. For instance, one of my colleagues, he reads esophageal manometry. That takes time. That's not necessarily the best use of his time, but we have um, maneuvered ways to make sure that he is compensated, not necessarily from a financial standpoint, because as you folks know, that's not the only way that you can be compensated with time being kind of the other biggest factor. Additional questions that you may or may not have thought of, but uh, I felt uh, might be helpful. Uh, just from an overall 10,000 uh, foot view for these contract negotiations. Why is the position open at a certain hospital? Is it because they are expanding? Uh, are they expanding within their institution or are they expanding say to cover five other hospitals? Uh, and then that would kind of underlie what their expectations are for you. Or has there been attrition? And if so, why are they leaving the practice? Uh, which can also kind of be enlightening for follow-up questions in terms of what is being done to help remedy the attrition. Uh, what is the future direction? Kind of segues in terms of um, uh, those other questions that you're asking. And then how do the senior physician contracts uh, or schedules differ, if at all? Um, some of the broader points uh, for physicians uh, at my institution who've been here for over 20 years, uh, salary is unchanged, um, backbone of the contract is not changed, but they've carved out other ways to make their contract or schedule a little bit different. And then you can ask, how did that happen? Why did that happen? What can I do to kind of get to that level? Uh, and so those are kind of things that help you at least glean more information so you have an idea of what, um, what you're working with and who you're negotiating with, more importantly. Um, final thoughts. Um, this is not the match. Know your worth. Uh, you are worth it, although I will again say that um, you, you are also expendable. Um, and I, one of the big questions is how do you want to spend your time, right? Do you want to spend your time doing uh, research? Do you want to spend your time running a business? Do you want to spend your time uh, doing other pursuits? And that is one of the large things that you should think about when you're choosing any of these uh, different job avenues, uh, because we, we still do spend the majority of our time at, at work. And so you want to make sure that you're enjoying it and you're doing exactly what you wanted to do with this degree and all this hard work that you guys have put in um, through all this. Most things could be negotiated, but at a certain point, you got to ask yourself, is there a better fit elsewhere? And so really think about what matters most to you um, in, in life um, and your career. 
Uh, like Dr. McKay was saying, strongly consider a lawyer if you're negotiating with private practice. Otherwise, just ask a lawyer friend um, or at minimum another physician who's in a similar job setting um, so that because uh, a lot of times they've gone through all of this similar to what we have and then can impart that advice upon you. And again, your next job doesn't have to be your last job. Your first job doesn't have to be your last job either. And so it's it's OK if there's misgivings about what you set out to do. Or, or the job that you accepted, because you can you can always cut bait, and so um, don't don't be too worried about it. Uh, keep an open mind, um, and you guys are already doing the right thing by getting more information ahead of time. All right, uh, I thought I was the last one, so I included this one, but I'll I'll shoot it over to Anza. Thank you so much, Dr. Park. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, Dr. Wong will be next. Um, just a brief introduction. Dr. Wong is a uh, native of South Bend, Indiana, where she was born. She was graduate of Northwestern for undergraduate and medical degrees. Um, she went on um, to complete internal medicine residency and GI fellowship at UCSF, where she also served as chief fellow. And currently she practices general gastroenterology with a special interest in esophageal disorders and functional GI diseases. She has specialized training in esophageal manometry and pH impedance studies. And she's currently assistant clinical professor of medicine at UCSF at the San Francisco VA Medical Center. In her free time, she enjoys running and hiking in beautiful Marin County where she lives with her husband. Thanks so much, Dr. Hai. Um, all right, so I'm gonna wrap up our session here um, just briefly discussing contract negotiation and academics. Um, and I also will say that I also have experience working at Kaiser and the employee model, so also open to answering any questions about that in the Q&A later. And everyone can see my slides, right? Okay. Um, so as everyone else has mentioned already, I think the first thing to just say is that this is a time when you finally get to decide what you want. So unlike med school, residency, fellowship, you know, where you're kind of just going through the motions, this is probably the first juncture that you have where you have to really understand yourself, your career goals, your personal goals, and figure out how they're all gonna line up. So be honest with yourself, do some soul searching as you go onto the job search, because this, this job is really gonna be what fits you and your goals. Um, so if you're going into academics, as you know, there's a variety of paths, but in general, know which way you're going to go. Are you going to be an educator? Or are you going to be a scientist? Or are you going to try and do a little bit of both? Um, one thing, just caveat, I am not a bench researcher or anything like that. So if that is what you're looking for in an academic job, unfortunately, I don't have much personal experience with negotiation in terms of grants and that, that kind of thing. Um, but I can tell you about my experience with academics as a clinician educator. So what's negotiable, as you see from the slide and from our other talks um, from Dr. McCabe and Park, uh, many things can be negotiable. Um, and what I would say is similar to what Dr. Park's slide showed in terms of what is or is not. Generally speaking, I would say the same categories are, are generally true for academics, because at the end of the day, you're thinking about a large institution as opposed to a private practice where some of the nuances can be negotiated more because you're working with a smaller group of people um, without that, that big group behind you. Um, similar to the employee model, there are some things that are gonna be more standardized. These benefits like insurance, your retirement, parental leave, even vacation time, those things are probably gonna be more standardized in my experience. Um, for example, at UCSF and at the VA, there's just, there's like a big institutional handbook or a website with the policies. So this is your health insurance. This is how retirement works. And even for vacation, um, my experience is that it's kind of the same in terms of how much vacation time you accrue over a period of you know, your paycheck period or whatever. Um, but there is probably gonna be some departmental flexibility in how they let you take the time or you know, how close are they monitoring your accrual of that vacation. But generally speaking, these are gonna be things that are just kind of packaged just for any employee at your institution. So some things unique to academics, do negotiate. You know, As you see um, in Dr. McCabe's slides, there's a lot of room for negotiation in private practice, but even in the employed model in academics, even if you are negotiating against a larger institution, there, there are some steps that you can take to negotiate. Um, I think it's really important for you to make sure you're protecting your academic time. 
in your contract, you know, that's why you're going into academics is that you're going to be a clinician and see patients, but you want to do scholarly work, whether that's research or medical education, or TY, that's why you're doing academics. So make sure that you have that time built in into your contract. Um, the other thing to do is what I call your clinical reps, you know, at the same time, you still want to be a good doctor. And especially in a procedural specialty like ours, you also want to make sure that your schedule is built so that you still have enough time in endo and enough time seeing patients so that you're practicing up-to-date medicine um, and feeling comfortable with your clinical work. Um, uh, another aspect of the clinical medicine part of academics is that this is where you could really think about really super subspecializing. You know, if you really want to be just a hepatologist and seeing only hep patients, you could do that. If you only want to see IBD patients or do motility, this is where you actually have that, that space. Um, so have that discussion up front if, if, you, if you want that to be part of your career. Um, like Dr. Park mentioned, career development and mentorship is really important in academics, especially as a junior faculty to really succeed in your career. This may be something less that you, you're quote unquote negotiating, you know, putting in writing, but that's something you want to have a conversation about during the interview processes. What are those opportunities? Because you want to make sure you have the support you need in your division to be successful. Um, and then regarding your division chief, this is going to be the main person you're speaking with. This person is the deal maker, you know, the decision maker. They're going to be the main one who's going to be supporting your career. So be honest with them about what you're looking for and what your goals are, because that person is going to be there to help make, you, make that possible for you. Um, briefly, in terms of salary, um, as has been mentioned before, you have to do your homework on this. So know either the market in your region or your state. Um, so, you know, the Bay Area may be different than Hawaii or Reno or, you know, wherever you may be looking. Um, so you have to understand the market in your region. So that research may be looking online, talking to friends, co-fellows, other people that you know who have recently gone through the experience. So you have a general range. Even if you're, you know, if you're only looking at academics, it still may be helpful to apply for an interview at non-academic jobs because then you have a sense of what the salaries are in your region at other kinds of practices that, so that you can get that range. Um, and then the last thing is that a public institution such as the University of California, technically our salaries are available online. So it is public information. So you can look up inf that kind of salary information online to, to get a range. Um, as has been mentioned, there's a variety of other perks that you could ask for. Um, again, they're probably not deal breakers, but they may sweeten the deal if you're able to negotiate that sign-on bonus or that relocation um, expense. Um, the schedule is probably one of the most important things that you want to negotiate. So as has been mentioned before, you should understand what is your 1.0 full-time FTE job look like? Is that a four or five day work week? And have a sense in your contract what your day-to-day -day is going to be like, you know, how much clinical versus academic time will you have built in? How much of that is going to be endoscopy? How much, you know, inpatient call you're going to take? And then in terms of academics, you should also understand how much of that clinical work is going to be staffed with fellows. So it's not a guarantee that your clinic is going to be with fellows. Um, so you have to decide if that's something that you want or don't, um, but do understand that concept and have that in writing. Um, remote work is also a possibility, you know, especially in these days, we are doing a lot of clinic remotely. So you can have that in writing if that's something that you really want in terms of your job, for example, having a day or week of remote clinic. So something to think about. Um, in terms of the academic appointment, this is something unique to the academic position is this will help you determine how promotion or advancement works at your institution. So it's gonna vary um, depending on where you work. This slide that I have here is just a, like a snapshot of what we have at UCSF. So there's a series, a rank and a step. And the series is generally what your career pathway is. So if you are in residence, that means you are a researcher, you're 80% research, for example, your promotion is gonna be based on how much research you're doing and how productive you are. Um, on the other hand, you could be a health sciences clinical professor. So that's the other end of the spectrum where you're primarily a clinician, that's your main contribution to the institution, but you're also doing some scholarly work. It could be known on a regional level or maybe a national level, but you're not stressing out too much about 
getting those papers in. Um, the middle is that professor of clinical X where you're doing a lot of clinical research or you're nationally known for your education work. Um, so there's a, kind of a higher standard that you get, you, you're, you have to make to be that professor of clinical X. Um, so that's just some things to think about in terms of how, how you're gonna be promoted. Um, the rank, as you can see, can vary from assistant to full. And then we have this thing called steps where basically it takes a few years to go from each step. So assistant professor can have steps one through six, then associate. Um, so these are things you can actually negotiate for. Commonly, if you're gonna start from fellowship, you'll probably be an assistant professor, step one, depending on where, you know, what your goal is, you might be a health sciences clinical professor, you know, and you work your way up. Um, but for example, if you were a chief resident or you had, had another job before this, this academic position, you know, you could negotiate to say that you're a step two, for example, so that you could start a little higher up than that absolute bottom of the totem pole. Um, this has been kind of mentioned before, trying to get the support that you need. But again, this may be out of the division chief's control, especially in our this day and age resorts to staffing shortages. Um, so finally, as I mentioned, be honest with yourself, know your division chief and have them understand your goals, get everything in writing. It's not, it's not official unless it's in writing. Um, in terms of the negotiation, if possible, I'd advocate for in-person communication. You know, with COVID and everything, at least when I was interviewing, things were mostly happening by, tell, you know, remotely. But if you're able to meet that person, meet your team in person for negotiations, I think that's ideal. But, you know, you could have a Zoom call or a telephone. But I, I think those are preferable um, as conversations as opposed to just email. Um, have somebody review your contract with you, whether that's a mentor or an employment lawyer. But if you are hiring a lawyer, it should be an employment lawyer. So somebody who specifically reviews physician contracts. So not just any lawyer, but hire somebody who does this for a job. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks again, Dr. McCabe, Dr. Park, Dr. Wong for some excellent talks, um, lots of great information. Um, the chat is open for questions. Um, also, if anyone has any direct questions, they can go ahead and ask them now. Um, I know that there was uh, one question, you know, we can kind of go ahead and ask um, is, um, you know, how many groups do you, is it reasonable to negotiate with at once? Um, you know, you probably, I think the question is kind of, you probably don't want to, be negotiating multiple different factors with five different groups, or or perhaps you do want to do that. Um, and similarly, along those lines, you know, how do you balance, you know, your potential or existing personal relationships with some of the people in these groups um, when you're negotiating, so as you don't kind of offend or give off a bad vibe to your future partners. I, mean, I guess I'll start. I, mean, I think it comes down to the personal level of comfort. Um, I think I've been accused of being maybe overly conscientious about not causing offense. I mean, a common phrase I hear is you need to do what's best for you. Um, I think I would try to be upfront about, you know, any misgivings or reservations you have, whether it's, you know, maybe re relocating too far or what um, constraints that you, you have on that front. Um, as to the number of groups, I think it comes down to personal comfort. Um, and sometimes it just comes down to timing. I, I traveled more and it was harder to, I guess, negotiate simultaneously. Like I had an interview in Spokane in November, but San Luis Obispo in January. Um, so I couldn't really uh, compare and match those together versus if you do like five in the Bay Area, sure, um, um, that you, you may be weighing multiple things um, at that point. Yeah, I was very regional. Uh, literally just, well, uh, I, I interviewed in the Bay Area too, but mainly Hawaii and I just crammed them all in at one time and uh, Hawaii is tiny. Uh, we know all of the gastroenterologists in the entire state and so it behooved me to play nice 
that's not to say that I didn't ask the hard questions. And quite frankly, I, I had to tell a fair amount of my colleagues now and some of my mentors that I wasn't going to work with them. I didn't want, I, I didn't like the contract that was being offered. And I think as long as you're honest up front and, and yeah, as long as you're honest and upfront about it, uh, if they have any hard feelings about it, it's more just their ego and it's not your problem. Yeah, I think the key takeaway is just being professional and cordial. And that um, that's probably often why we, that, that concept of potentially getting into a conflict is often why we maybe struggle with negotiation or, or don't do it enough. But um, I think I think if you have that mentality that you are being professional and cordial and honest with yourself and with your future employer, and that the point of the negotiation for is for you guys to mutually work out something that's beneficial, right? Like you're going to be a great doctor for them and provide good services. And if they can support you in your career goals, that's only going to benefit them. Um. Thank you so much for those. Um, again, I open it up to anyone in the audience to ask any questions. You know, another question that was um, asked in the chat is um, how many versions uh, or drafts did you go through before finalizing um, your contracts? And or, and or how many is a reasonable amount to kind of go back and forth with? I guess I don't, I don't know how many contract drafts is reasonable. I, I stopped at two. Um, it, it became clear that I think my group had some firm lines in the sand. They, they weren't interested in changing the non-compete radius. Um, yeah, there were only two groups in town in Reno, and, and I didn't. I mean, it's it's big, but also small enough where you run into people. So I, I didn't plan on staying if something awry happened, which, which happened. Um, so I decided not to fight that, um, and then. I think there are other limitations specific to the contract. So earning back the salary, that, that's how they had done it for, I think, 20 years. Um, so I could have asked for a higher salary, but that would have delayed um, eligibility to become partner. So I didn't fight that either. I straight up negotiated to get rid of all non-compete clauses for any of the contracts that I was even considering in Hawaii. 25 mile radius puts me in the ocean. And so I, I would either have to work on another island uh, or uh, the, con the clause had to leave. And so the, they were willing to meet me there. Um, obviously, I didn't sign with them, but um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's just an example of um, knowing where your hard stops are. Yep. So if there's something you absolutely need in your contract, then that's something you have to fight for. But Otherwise, I would agree with Dr. McCabe that probably one or two is, is probably the most that you're going to need, especially if you're working with an experienced lawyer. All right. Uh, got um, a couple more questions coming in the chat. Um, does it matter what time of year you apply for a job at an academic hospital versus community hospital versus private practice? I'll say I don't know if it really matters. Um, you know, at least for academics, if you're, you know, people start applying in the fall, but I know that they're, you know, really it's just that we're looking for somebody to start in academics often in, in the new year. So whether that's July through October. So I don't think it really matters. Um, but generally speaking, I would aim to start applying for jobs in the fall of before the, the year that you graduate from fellowship. Yeah, uh, the employed institutions, I mean, we, we have some idea, right, of when people are graduating. So we, we know that, you know, winter is coming. And so um, it, it's about time that people are looking. Um, but um, you know, for, for us, for example, we, we've had an open position for a while and we do uh, field um, uh, re requests, visits, CV, um, uh, CVs at any point uh, during the year. 
Uh, a lot of times though, the ones that are coming in mid-year uh, are from people who already have jobs. Um, yeah, I echo the sentiments, um, imminent fellow graduations and anchor points. Um, I think like Dr. Park said, um, there's probably more, I mean, you, you can apply like a February or a, a March. Um, it depends on region. Um, outside of California, I think a lot of private practices are looking a lot. Um, and sometimes they'll sign people very early. I think one group signed a second year fellow and um, we're anticipating that person would join in a year and a half, basically. Um, I, I know we're over uh, seven o'clock, but we do have some more questions. Um, I want to know if our speakers are uh, okay with continuing. If not, we can um, have them forward those questions to you via email, perhaps, um, if that would be okay. But I'm open to do whatever you guys are open to. I'm available to stay on for a few more minutes. Okay. Uh, so am I. We'll keep going with questions. Um, so uh, one question was, uh, how open are jobs to industry contracts or consulting opportunities? And they and do they take a financial cut usually? I'll say oh. for academics, that's um that's built into the institutional policies. So there's not going to be room for negotiation for that kind of thing. And it's kind of like what um, Dr. Park was saying with the employed model is that generally speaking, if you do any extra work outside of your clinical work at that institution, that money is going to be partly theirs. So um, it, it kind of varies depending on what exact what you know the nature of the work that you're doing, how much you're making from doing that, that intellectual property as well. But generally speaking, for example, if you're at UCSF, whatever extra money you make is partly going to UCSF. Um, as a cop-out answer, it's highly variable as well. Probably depends on group size. Um, probably the standard is if you're doing a lot of consulting, um, that probably takes away from clinic time. So you, you maybe they would want you to stay on a locum's basis if you want to fill in for um, like a surgery center block or do clinic. Um, other groups are more flexible. The smaller ones I've spoken to, um, some of them have very simple rules. If you cover call, cover overhead, you can kind of do whatever you want after that. I Meaning if you want to make 200 grand a year, fine. Um, in some of the ACG committees, um, some private practice doctors are heavily involved. Um, and that's either on their kind of own time um, or, or um, uh, the group buys out sometimes, especially if they're like managing partner because um, they want someone to run the group um, and, and to compensate them for that. Um, also brings a bit, bit of prestige um, to the group in that case, if they're like on an ACG committee, I, I don't know so much about consulting, but um, there is some flexibility, but it's really group dependent. Yeah, same thing for institutions. Um, uh, the institution that I worked at, we recently nixed um, that ability to um, do consulting work. Um, okay, just uh, two more questions. Um, Dr. McCabe, you touched on this. Um, is it appropriate to ask about maternity leave in private practice, or is that question a little bit taboo? Um, Good question. I, the short answer is I don't know. I don't think it would be taboo, um, especially the out-of-state private practices I spoke to. They want people. Um, so, and they want to make you happy. Um, and there's a greater need for women in GI too. Um, so at the same time, I don't know the parameters behind that, but I would think that they would want to make that work for you, um, you know, in some way. I, I, I don't know how they would. Um, there's a fair amount of limited imagination in general, like it's either time, money, there's not much around that to help um, make things faster in, in some respect. But I don't think it is taboo. and, and you. The difficulty is my soapbox, I guess, you know, you finish training in your earlier mid thirties, you work so hard and you want to have a family. I mean, you don't have forever. Um, so so you, you, should, you should ask about it, I think. All right, and uh, last question. Um, how do you go about finding an employment lawyer? Or I should say a, a 
a good employment lawyer. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I'll answer. I went through the white coat investor. I think in 2019, the, the two recommendations then were um, the contract diagnostics. Uh, I emailed them, I think second. I, I didn't really hear back from my, them, but you know, that's, I guess I, I, I trust uh, Dr. James Dolly who endorses that. And then uh, it was Doc, uh, Mr. Dennis Hirsch, who's a lawyer in Pennsylvania. He also has a newsletter. He has a, he has a book that he does too. Um, and I, I found them to be fair. Like, um, he, he was you know, straightforward, um, explained what the standards were. Um, some errors still happened. Um, like we, we didn't catch the um, uh, exit fee payments you know, with, between day 90 and, and day 360. Uh, so these things are complex. Um, for a same state lawyer, you know, if you're worried about arbitration, um, that's a little tougher. You, you probably have to know people in town. Reno is a little small. I went through my alumni club and it turned out lawyers in my alumni club already represented my practice. And they're like, hey, we can't help you. Um, um, so that, that can be a little tougher to think of state here. Um, but I, I just have to start with the white coat investor. Um, and then some CPMC faculty who did private practice knew, I think, a few people as well. Um, so that might be an alternative if you know people in the area. I actually didn't use an employment lawyer myself, um, but I would say that um, I did ask around. And so primarily I got recommendations from word of mouth. So from people I knew who had recently gone through the process who so did use a lawyer. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for all the information, the great talk, the answers to all the questions. Very helpful um, and uh, really priceless, all the information you guys gave us. So thank you so much. Um, and I think we'll close there. Um, don't forget to submit your uh, reimbursements if you ordered a meal. And uh, the link is there for the um, CME credit. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a bunch, guys. Thanks for that.